record. Before I get open. All right, let's see as people come in. Welcome everybody. It is time for another quarantine virtual teen science cafe. Come on in. I am going to share my screen. As you all come on in, for those of you that are new, um, what we like to do is find the chat box. If you hover your mouse towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a chat box. If you can open that up, we'd love it if you can introduce yourselves. Choose the all panelists and attendees and just let us know who you are and where you are from today. So welcome those of you, Amanda from Brattleboro and Rachel from Corinth. Sylvia is here from South Burlington, it's great. Lena, awesome, you made it. Chris, Lena is the one that you spoke to a yep. while back. So I'm glad that she's here. We got some Mainers with us today, some folks from New Jersey and New Hampshire. Welcome everybody, it's so nice to see you all. So as we go on, if you need our closed captioning services today, I'm about to enter a link into the chat. You can click on the link provided to get the closed caption services. Um, as you all are continuing to introduce yourselves, what I want to do is just go over our Zoom protocols for when we gather like this. Um, everyone is muted today. That is the way our Zoom webinars work for Science Cafes. Um, you're able to share your thoughts um, in our chat box, but we ask that you stay on topic. Um, keep the, ch the chatting <laughs> to um, be relevant to today's topic about threats to gorillas and what our presenter is going to share. Any questions you might have are actually going to go in a separate location. If you look at the menu on the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a selection for Q&A box. Any question you have for our presenter today, you're going to put your question in there. And as he has time and space in the presentation, he'll, he'll answer your questions. They'll definitely get answered before we wrap up today. One thing you should know about the Q&A box, if you like a question someone else has asked, you can actually click on the thumbs up and that will actually upvote the question. So it moves it up the ranking and we'll see it sooner. We'll know that more people are interested in the answers. So we ask that you be courteous and respectful today. Just make sure you don't create any distractions. Mostly what that means today is um, using the chat box inappropriately, just really creating um, a lot of chatter that interrupts people who want to really be focusing on the presentation. So stay engaged, participate fully. I'm telling you, this one is going to be good. Our topic today is guns, germs, and cell phones, threats to gorilla conservation. Our presenter is Chris Whittier. I will tell you, Chris is a personal friend of mine. We actually went to college today, and that is how we got someone uh, with his background here, because he is not a Vermonter. Chris is a wildlife veterinarian and an epidemiologist who directs the Tufts Center for Conservation Medicine as a research assistant professor at Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University in North Grafton, Massachusetts. He previously worked for the Smithsonian and for the Gorilla Doctors in Central Africa, where he did his PhD research on gorilla health and disease. So with that, I'm gonna unshare my screen and let's all welcome Chris and let's learn a little bit about gorillas today. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, let me get my presentation shared. And can you all see that now? Okay. Let me just move that over to um, the, actually, let me do this. Let me just move my camera so I'm not looking away from the screen. Um, hello, everyone. So um, it's, it's a pleasure for me to, to join you today. 
uh, you know, I, th I think Lauren uh, said that I, I am not a Vermonter, but I did, I did grow up in New Hampshire, so I have a little bit of um, New England um, credit, hopefully, with, with most of you. Uh, so I want to talk to you today about um, gorillas and some of the threats to their conservation. And um, I hope this will be um, fun and, and entertaining and educational for everyone. Um, I'm mostly going to show pictures and tell stories. And I'm, I'm uh, very used to talking to um, graduate students in, in the program that I, that I direct. And I sometimes talk to elementary schoolers, but I don't often talk to um, high schoolers and kids your age. So hopefully I've, I've gauged everything um, properly. And, and um, if uh, I talk about a lot of this stuff very frequently, so hopefully you'll have a lot of questions. And if there's anything that's, that's not clear, just go ahead and uh, put questions in, in the Q&A and, and we'll talk about those at the end. So I wanted to start off um, with our first um, poll question and um, try to get a sense from the audience of what you know about, about gorillas. So the first question is, how many different types of gorillas are there? And your choices are one, two, three, or more than five. I'm gonna give All you right. And we're going to be launching a poll. So you're going to see it on your screen right now. You can make your selection. If for some reason you don't see it, you can just put your answer in the chat box. And people are voting fast and furiously. We'll give a few more seconds. But it looks like, Chris, 50% think more than five. Yeah, I can see that. That's, um, this, is, this, is a, this is a very interesting result to me. So normally, um, I, I would have guessed that most of you would have said that the answer to this is one, um, because I feel like most people um, don't know that there's um, more than, than one different type of gorilla. So that's, that's great. Um, and those of you that said two, um, looks like there's about four of you. That, that was actually the answer that I'm looking for. Um, but this is also, um potentially can I, I can close the poll now lauren yes the screen i can see yeah okay yep. um so the the um answer to this really depends on what you what you're thinking of as different types so if you're thinking about different types as different species there are two different species of gorillas and so those are um, currently classified as the eastern species and the western species and these are these are adult males from each of those different species of gorillas and you can see that they they look a little bit different so if you look at a, at a map um, of Central Africa, um, on the western side where the, there's sort of the two light, light brown patches here, that's the ranges for the, the western gorillas. And there's actually, the, there's the western species, and then you can divide those into two different subspecies. And it's the same in the east. So the, the pink and the red um, spots on this map are where the eastern species are. And so there are two different species, but then there's also within each species, there are two different subspecies. So this, this all gets a, a, little bit, um, a little bit detailed and a little bit confusing, but um, that's just to say that there are um, a bunch of different types of gorillas, um, depending on, on how you look at them. So if you think about the, the you know, I like to try to, um, I'm going to try to teach you a little bit. This is, this is Chris's uh, everything that you need to know about gorillas in about 10 minutes. Um, and so the, the first uh, difference that I like to point out with the different types of gorillas and, and where they live in Africa are that the Western gorillas um, tend to live in the really flat um, part of the, the Congo Basin. So the, this picture here, you can see that the Western gorilla is on the, on the left. And actually, most of the time, they're in that sort of thick forest that's in the back of this picture. Um, and, and you can see that the, the gorilla in the front there is in the, in the young one are in what looks like a field. And these are actually called bys in, in Central Africa, so they're big open meadows. But most of this forest is really a pretty thick forest, like, like you can see in the back there. Then with the eastern gorillas, um, the, the most famous or the best known of the eastern gorillas are, are the mountain gorillas. And those are, so that's one of the types of eastern gorillas. And, and the reason that they're called mountain gorillas is because they live in the mountains. So you can see in this picture that the you know, gorilla that's pretty high up in these, these really um, steep and, and um, sharp mountains. So these mountains are actually much um, higher than even the mountains that we have um, here in New England. Um, they, the altitude is really, really high. And so there's some places up here that even though we're in the middle of Africa, that you can actually get snow um, in, in the forest and, and ice um, up on top. And these mountains are actually also, uh, one of them is an active volcano and all the rest of them are, are extinct volcanoes. So that's the, the, one of the big differences between these Eastern and Western gorillas. The other um, differences are, are kind of physical and, and normally um, if we were in class together, I'd, I'd ask you to sort of point out what you might be able to see as some of the 
physical differences between these gorillas. Um, but if you look closely, you can see that the, the gorilla is on the left. So that's a, a, a big male um, that's looking at the camera and then there's a female in the back. And then on the right, the, the big male is the, the, obviously the biggest one. And if you look at the comparison between the two males, you can see that the, the mountain gorilla on the right has much sort of shaggier fur. So his hair is a lot longer. And yeah, part of that is because, you know, they, they live at the relatively high altitude and so it gets pretty cold. And so they're adapted to be in, in that cold environment. So they've got sh thicker, shaggier fur. The other, other differences um, are that you can see that the Western gorilla on the left has a little bit of brown or almost kind of red on his forehead. And so that's one of the other um, differences that you can usually tell looking at the differences between gorillas. Um, and then it's not really apparent in this picture, but the Eastern gorillas are also tend to be a little bit bigger than, than the Western gorillas. And so if any of you have ever seen gorillas in zoos, the gorillas that you've seen have been the Western gorillas. So the ones like in, in this left picture, and even though they don't all look exactly like this, some of them are a little bit shaggier, um, but the, all of the gorillas that are in zoos everywhere in the world are, are the kind that come for the Western species. Okay, so our next poll question, um, how many gorillas are there left in the wild? And the choices are uh, less than a thousand, uh, around a hundred thousand, more than a million, or that nobody really knows. So let me give you a chance to answer that question. All right, I just launched the poll, so you should be seeing that now. Let's see what y'all think. And everybody's pretty divided this time. Yeah. Although it looks like around 100,000 is gaining a little bit. <laughs> yep. So um, looks like we got the, the, most of the answers there. So yeah, so those of you that said um, around 100,000, so that, that is the, the correct answer. So there are some types of, of, the, of the different subspecies of gorillas where that there is less than 1,000 individuals left. But if you take all of the gorillas of all the different kinds, the two different species um, combined, it's you know, right around 100,000. Um, but the question of nobody really knows is also not a bad answer because at least with the Western gorillas, we don't really have um, very accurate estimates of, of how many of them um, are left in the wild. So, um, so there's the uh, answer we're looking for is 100,000. And so 100,000 might seem like a, a lot of gorillas, you know, in some sense. And, and um, but it, to put that in perspective, you could take all of these gorillas across their whole range and, and all of Central Africa and basically fit them all into one bit, really big football stadium. Um, so that, that hopefully gives you some idea that even though 100,000 might seem like a lot, it's really not, not a lot. Um, and I looked this up earlier today. So the, the population of Burlington, um, Vermont, so the city I think that you guys are most familiar with, um, is about, about half this many. So it's around 40 or 45,000. So it's about, about twice as many people that live, in Vermont, that live in Burlington um, are, are as many gorillas as there are in the world. So it's really not very many. And so the, all of the gorillas are, are endangered species, um, it, it, which means that they're, you know, that they're threatened from the various things that we're gonna talk about today. So a couple other um, just things to, to know about gorillas. So gorillas are, are social animals, which means that they, they live in social groups, um, which we usually refer to as families. And so in, in every family, um, there's at least one adult male and there can be groups if they're big enough that there can be more than one um, adult male. And so if you don't know, adult male gorilla is, is called a silverback. And so that's not a, uh, sort of a particular, some people think that that's a, a type of gorilla or a species of gorilla, but silverback just refers to these, these older um, adult males. And once they um, get to be adults, then the, the hair on their back turns gray or silver. So that's why they're called silverbacks. Um, so in any group, there's, there's um, at least one adult male. And, and even if there's other, more than one adult male, there's always the one who's, who's the dominant one, who's kind of the boss. Um, and then usually a bunch of different females and, and their babies kind of make up the rest of the group. So um, gorillas are also um, what we call dimorphic. So that means that there's a difference in the, the size between the males and females. So this is a picture, um, you can see the, the adult male on the left. Um, and adult male gorilla is about 400 pounds. Um, adult female, you can see the female on the right here that has a little baby in her lap. Um, and adult female is about half as big. So adult female gorilla is about 200 pounds or, or kind of the size of an of a adult human man. So, um, so males are about twice as big as females. And you can see that they're physically, you know, not only bigger, but they have these much bigger heads and, and they're, they're gray silver backs and things too. 
So even though I, I, when talking about guerrilla groups, I said that there, you know, there's one male um, who's who's kind of the boss. It's really the the females or the mother gorillas that are the glue that really holds a gorilla family together. Um, so the the females are really um, really important for the social structure, and as their babies are born, that's really part of what holds a gorilla family together. And so the the picture on the left here, um, that's it. That is, it looks like a baby chimpanzee because the the skin on the the baby is kind of pink. Um, but the baby mountain gorillas are are born this color, and then they slowly their skin turns black in the first couple of weeks. And then you know once they're about uh, the the two gorillas on the right, the babies are a um, little less than a year old, and you can see that the, their skin is uh, turned totally black by that time. And the two on the right are actually twin gorillas. And so um, twin gorillas can be born. Um, there, you know, it's not very common, sort of similar to people where it's not very common for, for twin uh, people to be born. Um, but usually with, with gorillas, when they do have twins, it's often very hard for the mother to take care of two twins. So, so it's not, um, it's the babe, twin baby gorillas actually don't always both survive to be adults because it can be too hard for, for the mother to take care of both of them. So the other, um, one of the last important things to know about gorillas is that they are um, almost exclusively vegetarian. So um, even though gorillas have big teeth, and I'll show you some of those in a minute, um, almost all of what they eat are, are, are um, plants. So leaves and stems and shoots and bamboo and lots of different stuff like that. Um, the one exception though is that gorillas do eat some insects. Um, so this is the other kind, the, the insert picture here is a, a western lowland gorilla and the western lowland gorillas actually eat a lot of termites. So you can see it looks like a piece of dirt in that gorilla's hand. Um, that's actually part of a broken off termite nest um, and that gorilla is licking the, the termites and the termite eggs out, out of that, that termite nest. So the, the one other thing um, about gorillas, and so this is kind of important for people that are, that are working with and studying gorillas, um, is to try to be able to tell them apart. And so if you looked at these two gorillas um, that were kind of sitting out in the forest, it would be pretty hard to, to, tell, to tell them apart. They're kind of the same size. Their, their fur is kind of the same. Um, but if you look really closely um, at the faces of, of gorillas, you can see that they've got these different wrinkle patterns above their nose, above their nostrils. So if you, you can think about, you know, making a little kind of a cartoon or a little diagram of this, um, and it's what we refer to as a nose print, and then you basically have, you know, something that's kind of like a fingerprint or a little, a little diagram that you can use to help identify gorillas. And so for, for people like me that might be going to see different gorilla families on different days when I was a veterinarian, um, it was always really helpful and I had to have kind of a cheat sheet that I would bring with me to go and see the gorillas because you know I could tell some of them apart just because you know the big males are always very obvious but for a lot of the other gorillas I couldn't tell them apart unless I could sort of get a really good look at their nose and figure out you know what what this wrinkle pattern was. So our uh, last poll question for today is uh, the biggest um, threats to, to gorillas. Um, poaching uh, is first choice, habitat loss is the second choice, disease is the third choice, or all of the above is the last choice. All right, the poll's just been launched. Seems to be a pretty strong preference for all of the above here. With yeah. a couple others um, choosing the other the other choices. Oops. Yeah, it looks like yeah, seventy percent. So all all of the above, and so all of the above is is the answer that I was looking for. And and this is a question that again, it, it depends a little bit. There are some people that might say that. Poaching is the biggest threat. There's some people that might say that habitat loss is, um, but the important thing is to recognize that all, all of these are, are important um, threats to, to gorillas um, across, across Africa. And so let's talk about um, each of these in, in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about um, poaching gorillas, there's, there's really um, kind of two different kinds of poaching that happens with, with gorillas. So the first kind is um, poaching where the idea um, of the poachers is actually to, to try to capture the baby gorillas. And, the, um, and so this happens um, mostly with the Western lowland gorillas. And you know, as I told you before, um, gorillas live in, in family groups and, and they're, they're really protective of each other. And part of the reason that the males are so big is so that they can protect the family. 
So when, when poachers are trying to um, capture baby gorillas, they usually have to kill a whole family of gorillas in order to capture the babies, um, so which is obviously really terrible and really sad. Um, but that's part of why you know, poaching is a really big threat because sort of for every one baby gorilla that poachers might actually be able to capture alive, they've usually killed five or 10 or more than that that might be in the, in the family. The other thing that's kind of related to that is that there are still um, parts of, of, um, of Africa where people will still hunt and, and eat gorillas. And I know that sounds really, really kind of strange and, and scary, but if, you know, I'm sure many of you come from, you know, families who your, your parents or families hunt for deer and turkeys and different things in New England. So if you think about it, you know, in Africa, you know, gorillas are just a, another wild animal. So it's not, um, so historically it, it has been you know, part of the culture to be able to hunt and eat all kinds of different wild animals, including gorillas. Um, but now um, because they're endangered, they're actually protected. So it's, it's not legal to hunt them anymore, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't still happen. And so that's why we, we make a distinction between you know, hunting, which we usually think of as something that's legal and it's regulated um, versus poaching, which basically means that it's illegal. And so the, with the, the poaching gorillas um, and, and for, for food and for eating them, oftentimes what happens is that the you know, poachers might kill a whole family of gorillas, but a little baby gorilla doesn't really have, isn't really much to eat. And so they, that baby gorilla also might end up being a live baby that, that goes into the, the, the trade um, in baby gorillas. So, so that's all really sad, but that's one of the biggest um, threats for, for gorillas and also chimpanzees and, and some other animals in Africa. Um, and so these are some, some cases of um, some baby gorillas that we actually rescued um, from poachers when, when I was working as a, the veterinarian. And these gorillas have all now grown up and, and they're all um, healthy and happy. The other kind of poaching that, that um, happens with gorillas is kind of accidental poaching. And so the, the diagram on the left here is what's called a snare. And the idea is it's a, it's a wire or a rope that you kind of make, you make a loop out of and you attach it to a tree and you kind of hide it into the forest. And then if an animal steps in the middle of that loop, then the branch kind of springs and then the animal gets caught by the leg. And, and then the, the poachers will come and then ha have that animal in the trap and then they can you know, take that home as, as food. And so these traps are really made for animals like the one in this picture here, which is a diker, which is kind of like a really small deer. Um, and so these are common animals that, that are um, hunted, you know, and they're mostly not protected. So in most places it's actually um, legal to, to trap and to hunt them. Um, but usually you're, you can't, you're not supposed to, you're not allowed to do that in a national park in places where there are gorillas. But again, you know, be, even though it's illegal, it does still happen. And so hunters will, will set these kind of traps, hoping that they'll catch animals like these dikers, but by accident, they might actually trap gorillas and chimpanzees and other animals. And so um, gorillas are, are strong enough that if they do accidentally step into these traps with their hand or their foot, they're usually strong enough that they can break the, the rope or the wire off of the tree that it's stuck to, but then they have the wire or the rope kind of stuck around their hand or their foot. So um, these are a couple of pictures just of, of some um, feet from different gorillas that, that we um, had to anesthetize um, in order to remove these wire snares. So on the left, you can see that the wire is still you know, wrapped around that gorilla's foot and it's kind of sticking off. And then on the right, you can see we've taken that a wire off. This is a different gorilla, but you can, you can see that there's still a pretty bad injury there. And so, um, so this is something that, you know, tends to be an emergency. You know, the gorillas can, these will get tighter and tighter and sometimes the, the gorillas can die from this um, or they, they're eventually they, they might have uh, their hand or their foot might basically just kind of get infected and, and basically fall off. Um, but if they don't die from it. So this is, this is another kind of accidental poaching of gorillas. So, you know, while we're talking about injuries, just want to point out that there are also lots of sort of normal injuries that, that gorillas might have. And so even, you know, when I was a, the veterinarian, sometimes we got called out because there were gorillas um, that might be injured. Um, but normally, if these were just sort of natural injuries that, that happened, then we usually just left, left those gorillas alone because it's, it's natural and it's normal. So I told you earlier that um, in any gorilla group, there's usually um, one, one dominant male, but that doesn't mean that the other adult males in the group might not try to fight sometimes. And so, um, so and, and they also might try to fight between groups. So this is actually a picture where the, the male that's in the way background is from a different group and he's, and he's come into this group um, and he's mostly trying to take gorillas from this group and have them join his family. Um, but sometimes this can lead to, to fights between the gorillas. And so I told you earlier that 
you know, the males have these really big teeth, um, even though they're vegetarian. And so this is, this is kind of give you an idea of that and kind of how big their teeth are. Um, and this is a little bit of a, of a bloody picture. So I'm sorry about that, but this is a, uh, gives you some idea of how bad the injuries can be um, from gorillas when they fight. Um, and this gorilla ended up being fine, um, but you can see that these are really, really bad wounds that he got just from fighting another gorilla. So this can be, these can be pretty serious. Um, but usually as a veterinarian, we, we, we let these kind of heal by, their, by themselves. The other, other um, you know, th sicknesses that gorillas can get, so these are gorillas that have, um, you can see that they're missing some of their hair, um, both the baby and kind of a, a, like a juvenile gorilla. And so these, these are caused by different, um, different parasites. So some of you have may, have, may have had, you know, cats and dogs that get, um, usually it's a disease that we call mange um, in cats and dogs um, that makes them really itchy. And so gorillas can, can also be affected by, by diseases like that. And then the, the, the other sort of big group in, um, of, of uh, you know, threats to gorillas, so we talked about um, poaching. So then the next sort of big category is, is sort of infectious diseases. And so these are all gorillas that you can see that they've got kind of snotty or runny noses. And it's because when, when gorillas get sick or catch colds, kind of like people do, um, they get sick the same way we do. So they, they cough and, and get sort of runny noses and they you know, might have a fever and they might feel really bad and they might not eat. And so they get sick really, really similar to we, how we do. Um, that's just a picture of a coughing gorilla because I don't, don't have a, a video. And so the, one of the important things that when, when we worry about with gorillas is because they're really closely related to people, that means that they can, they can actually share a lot of the same diseases and colds that people have. And so um, there's a lot of rules when people go to visit gorillas that they're supposed to stay a certain distance away. Um, and so probably most of you now you know, you know, with what's what's happening with with the with the pandemic, and that we're supposed to be staying a certain distance away from other people. And this is this is the same reason, you know, and and the same rule that's always been in place for the gorillas is making sure that people stay a, little, a, a safe distance away from them, so that if people do have germs, you know, bacteria and viruses, that they're not you know breathing those and spreading those into the air and, and making gorillas sick. Um, so this is this is one of the kind of important um, risks that that we always worry about. You know, that gorillas potentially getting sick. Um, from from being really close to people, and so the there's you know the the people in this picture you can see they all have cameras. So these are all tourists um, that have that have paid money to go out and be able to to visit um, the gorillas and to see them and take pictures. This is actually a very big very big business in, in parts of Africa where there's a lot of tourism for for the gorillas. <clears throat> There's also, you know, in addition to the tourists, there's also obviously all of the, the people that, that work there to protect the gorillas. So, you know, veterinarians, researchers that study their behavior, the park rangers, and, you know, and again, you know, there's, there's the, always a chance that there, you know, these people are gonna go into the forest and potentially um, be sick or have, it, have a, you know, a germ that they might be able to spread to gorillas. So there's also, you know, the same rules about staying a certain distance away also apply. And so the picture on the right here, um, I don't mean to, to show my friend breaking the rule, um, but it, you know, sometimes the gorillas will go where they want to go. And even though you try to stay a certain distance away, you know, the gorillas don't understand that rule. And so sometimes the gorillas will get, will get close to you as well. So there's a lot of opportunity for um, you know, people and gorillas to get too close to each other and for gorillas to get sick that way. The other um, important thing that I wanted to point out, um, you know, to, in, in addition to um, showing you, you guys some, some um, kids, you know, from this part of Africa, is to um, just sort of as a reminder that um, actually for, for kids, if, um, if they're under 15, you're actually not allowed to go and visit gorillas. And part of the reason for that is because, as probably many of you know, you know, when you're, when you're young and when you're in school, it's, it's much easier for you to get sick. Um, from your friends because, you know, you may have not have, have gotten all of your vaccinations, your immune system is not very strong. And so it's just more common for little kids to be able to have, you know, different diseases and to be sick. Um, and so for this, this is one of the reasons that, that little kids like this are not, not allowed to go um, and visit the gorillas and not just the, the local African kids, but the same, you know, with any of you that aren't 15, you wouldn't be allowed to go and see the gorillas. The other thing I wanted just to point out with this picture is, I think this is also kind of a reminder about um, how how hard the the habitat is, you know, here where the mountain gorillas live. It's really cold. You can see most of these kids have kind of sweatshirts and jackets on. You can see many of them have runny noses, and so they, you know, there aren't a lot of doctors in, in lots of these places in Africa. Um, a lot of these people don't have a lot of money, so they don't have, you know, very good access to, to doctors, and so it's it can be even more common and and easier for them to 
to be sick at different times. So that's another thing you have to think about um, protecting the gorillas from. So in addition to, to people, the gorillas can also get sick from other animals. And so these are just some pictures of, of gorillas that have gone outside of the forest. So um, outside of the forest, outside of the national park, um, is a, in, in many of these places, there are, are fields where farmers grow different crops, but they also can graze their animals. So you can see some cows, there are cows there on the upper left, and then there's some sheep um, in that other picture. And so it's possible that the gorillas can also um, come into contact with these other animals and also get sick from them. So because of all of these um, different you know, reasons and different possibilities of getting sick, the, the, um, uh, many, many years ago, a famous American woman who was studying gorillas um, wanted some veterinary help, mostly for the snares. And so she, she started or, or um, had, had the request to start um, what became a veterinary project. So it's what for many years was known as the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project and is now known as Gorilla Doctors. Um, and so this is a group of, of different um, veterinarians that work to, to try to help and protect the gorillas. And so now um, most of the veterinarians are all the African veterinarians that were that were from the countries where, where the gorillas live. So this has been a really nice project where you know the local people are helping to, to take care of the, the gorillas. So when you think about the so when I was there, you know, the different work that the that the gorilla doctors do. So one of them is is kind of training and monitoring. And so this is me working with the um, one of the veterinary assistants from one of the national parks and we're using a, a little computer that's kind of like a cell phone to be able to collect um, data and information about the gorillas. And we also do a lot of um, collecting of samples. So sometimes if we are actually doing work on gorillas, we might be collecting blood samples. Um, we actually collect a lot of poop samples from gorillas because you can actually learn a lot about their health and disease from their poop. Uh, so that's a lot of the work is actually doing kind of research on, on those kinds of samples. Um, one of the other things that, that we, that the project works on is basically making sure that the people that work with gorillas aren't, aren't sick because then you don't have to worry about sick people spreading um, those, those diseases and those germs to gorillas. So a lot of work goes into trying to make sure that the, the people are healthy um, to begin with. And then one of the last areas is also just doing um, different kinds of research. So this is me um, when I was working on my PhD with kind of a fancy machine that's analyzing DNA and looking for, for different viruses and, and some of the gorilla samples. And then, um, so all of that different stuff. And then very, very rarely um, as veterinarians do we actually do any, any hands-on work with, with the gorillas. So even though there's a bunch of veterinarians there, uh, if everything is going right and, and people are staying a safe distance away, and the teams that are they're uh, making sure that there aren't any snares or doing their work then there's usually not much for the veterinarians to do which is actually good um, but sometimes there are emergencies and there are problems and you do have to do do veterinary work the the other um, thing i just wanted to to mention is um, probably most of you have heard heard of ebola and so a couple of years ago, there was a really bad um, Ebola outbreak in, in one part of Africa. And even though that outbreak was in a different part of Africa from, from where the gorillas are, the, the gorillas um, have for a long time really suffered really badly from, from Ebola. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So Ebola is actually a really, really bad and really dangerous um, disease for gorillas. And this is something we've, we've known about for a long time. And so this is a headline from 2003, which is probably before I'm guessing before most of you were born. Um, so this has been a long time problem that, that we've um, seen and, and worked on with, with gorillas. Um, and then um, this, this um, as part of this work, you know, I got involved with a, a project um, where we actually went out to try to see if we could um, do any vaccination um, from, from gorillas and, and the, these Western gorillas to protect them from Ebola. So these are just some pictures from a, that park. Um, and you can see elephants on the bottom. Those are buffalo there in the middle, and then this bongo are those striped, um, those striped gazelles. And so um, we, we did a project in this area where we went out to see if we could actually vaccinate these gorillas to, to with, start to do the steps about protecting them from Ebola. Um, and so the, the you know, really, really big teams um, have been um, involved in, in this work. Um, and you know, I can never do um, any of this, this work without the important work of some of the local people. So these are some of the guys in the, the Central Africa. Um, that really helped me and, and were important with, with doing um, a lot of that work. And, and uh, you know, with any of the veterinary work, there's always a, a, a lot of teamwork that, that goes into and, and is um, involved in a lot of it. So, um, you know, yes, as a veterinarian, sometimes, you know, it's fun uh, to be out and sort of darting gorillas and doing the veterinary work. But if it weren't for all these other people that were involved, you know, a lot of this, the veterinary work um, couldn't get done. 
So, um, so I want to kind of um, finish off and wrap up by talking about all the stuff that, that everyone um, can be doing to try to help and and doing different kinds of gorilla conservation or helping towards gorilla conservation. And um, and if you notice, I also haven't haven't talked about um, one of the other parts of my title yet, which I'll get to in a second. So. What are the things that, that you, everybody can do um, for, for gorilla conservation? So one of them is to make sure that um, we're not kind of supporting things that are contributing to um, animals like gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans that are being used in entertainment. So this is a picture of a real chimpanzee that's obviously dressed up in a tuxedo, um, probably somewhere in Hollywood. And so it used to be um, pretty common and it still does happen where usually really small baby chimpanzees are used um, for movies and TV commercials and things like that. And so this is part of what um, makes people in Africa think that there's the, a market and the people that want to buy baby gorillas and chimpanzees. And so this is something that, you know, we are actually responsible for because we send these messages about how, you know, we, we, we like to, you know, see these things and we can be entertained by these animals. So this is one thing I would encourage you all um, to make sure that you're, you're you know, thinking about and and um, and trying not to sort of appreciate that um, that these are animals that shouldn't actually be used for entertainment. The other the other sort of big category of things you know have to do with our our consumption of resources, and so um, you know it, and and I think most of you and hopefully you know your generation is going to be much better about thinking about recycling and and reducing and reusing all the stuff that that we use. Um, but I want to give you a couple of sort of specific examples because probably many of you are thinking, you know, you're sitting in Vermont or somewhere in New England, and does it really matter, you know, what what things you're consuming that that might be, um, you know, helping helping gorillas? So I'll give you a couple of examples, and so the first one is to to think about mining. And so this is a, an open mine um, in in Central Africa, and you can see that the guys are basically you know collecting all this dirt, and so they're looking for different minerals um, that are that are in the ground there. And so probably most of you, you know, um, you know, you, you may not realize, but but things like diamonds that we use in jewelry, you know, those all come from the ground, and so a lot of those come from from mining. And so, um, in a lot of places, the the mi mining might be being done illegally, and that means that there's a lot of people that are in the forest and they're cutting down trees and they're eating wildlife and you know doing stuff that's usually illegal. Um, and so that can actually have a really big impact on, on gorillas. But the specific, one of the really specific things. Is, is a mineral that's called coltan. And you can see that the title of the name of that and the title here um, about artisanal mining for coltan. And this is a park that's in, in the Congo. And, um, and so coltan is actually a, a, like it's a metal that is used in a lot of electronics because it can conduct electricity really, really quickly and it doesn't get really hot. And so this is something that's really, really important for a lot of electronics. And a lot of this is actually mined illegally in, in, in a lot of the areas where, where gorillas live. And so, um, and so if, if normally if we were all, if I could hear all of you, um, I would ask you right now, or I would pose the question of, you know, how many of you have coltan in your pocket? And most of you would say, oh, of course I don't have any coltan in my pocket because, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, but the answer is that um, probably most of you, um, if you don't have it in your pocket, you have it um, within reach right now because coltan is, is an important mineral that's in all of our cell phones, um, as well as lots of other different kinds of electronics. So, um, so this is something that, you know, we, we don't really think about the fact that, you know, us, you know, using our cell phones or having lots of cell phones is actually, you know, potentially contributing to the, the conservation of animals like, like gorillas in Central Africa. And so most of us, you know, we're not be, be willing to, to give up our cell phone because, you know, we're, we've, we have a lifestyle here, particularly in the U.S., that we really rely on that. Um, but, you know, probably many of you or many of your parents probably have old cell phones that are sitting around in a drawer somewhere, you know, and there are actually some of the minerals in those that could be recycled. And so there's actually a lot of programs that will um, that will take back and, and help to get um, old cell phones that will go towards recycling. Um, and then some of that contribution will actually go back to, towards gorilla conservation. So this is just one of these things to, to think about, you know, every time that you, you know, when you're thinking about cell phones. And so I always used to be very proud that I could hold up a really old cell phone that I always used to have and, and say that, you know, I, I was trying to practice and do the things like I talked about. Um, and I have a relatively new cell phone now, so I can't do that anymore. But I will say that I have never ever bought a new cell phone. So every cell phone that I've ever owned, um, I, I bought used. So um, with trying to trying to you know limit the 
the amount of cell phones that at least I've been responsible for. So again, something that, that we can all kind of think about. <clears throat> and other, the other things um, that you can do, so probably most of you are not um, in, in the business yet of buying fancy furniture, um, but maybe, maybe your parents are. And one of the things that we don't often think about is that lots of fancy wood furniture, um, the wood that's used in the furniture comes from these tropical forests. And so there are you know, some of these really magnificent, really, really big old trees um, of certain types of wood. You know, some of it, some of it is, um, is kind of regulated and it comes from places where the trees are grown for this kind of wood. But a lot of it is actually coming from illegal um, cutting, cutting of the forest. And so this is the other, you know, the other big threat, um, you know, big issue with, with you know, conservation status with gorillas is habitat loss. And so a lot of this you know, is actually stemming from um, you know, cutting down forest. You know, a little bit of it is, you know, for the either for this fancy wood. More of it is actually just for you know plain old wood that people use to burn and to grow things. And then part of it is also to to be able to um, cut down for um, you know other other crops. And so the other thing that you can specifically do, even if you're not thinking about you know buying fancy furniture, um, is to think about other things that you consume. So you might be looking at this picture and be thinking, okay, you know Oreos and Pringles and you know these kind of you know, cookies and Kit Kats, these are things that, that probably many of you um, eat from time to time. And again, are not thinking about, you know, what does this possibly have to do with gorillas? And the answer, and some of you might know that, that there's a really big problem with palm oil um, everywhere in the world. And we usually think about palm oil um, and orangutans because most palm oil is actually grown in, in Asia where there are orangutans and it's a big threat to orangutans. But the tree that, that the, palm, the palm nuts and the palm oil comes from is actually native to Central Africa. And, and there's an increasing problem in Central Africa um, with cutting down the forest in order to grow um, the palm oil plantations. So this is not a really clear picture, but this is from an airplane. And you can see sort of in the top and in the left are, is the sort of natural forest. So if you imagine that first picture I showed you with the gorillas that were out in the field and the forest in the background, that's kind of the forest. But then you can see in the bottom and in the right part of the picture, you know, it's all square and it's all, you know, cut up for, for agriculture. And so those are all fields um, with different um, sort of stages of, of um, palm oil, you know, the trees for palm oil that have been growing in that. So it's actually, this is an increasing problem in Africa. And again, something that we should be thinking about, you know, when, when we um, consume products that have, have palm oil in them. And so the, the, just to kind of wrap up, um, and many of you probably didn't get the reference, and, and I'm guessing that most of you probably haven't read this book, but this is the, the title, and, and you know, I call this talk sort of gun, Guns, Germs, and Cell Phones, but this is kind of stolen from this very famous book that, that is about, you know, the title is Guns, Germs, and Steel. You know, and so the guns, obviously, you know, referring to poaching, um, and so, you know, we talked about that as a big threat to gorillas. You know, the germs, we talked about disease, you know, both from even things like, you know, common colds that people have, as well as things like Ebola. Um, and then instead of steel, you know, replace that with, with cell phones or coltan um, as, as a sort of example of um, part of what's the habitat destruction um, and is really kind of contributing to the problems with gorilla conservation. So that is all I have. Um, and um, that's my email address if anybody wants to kind of follow up and, and get in touch with me in the future. But I think we've got um, a bunch of time for questions. So. We do, and before we go to questions, I want to uh, point out one thing, and then I'm, I'm going to launch one poll before we get to questions. I know this about Chris, but I don't think the rest of you do. Chris, most of those photos in your presentation today were taken by you, correct? Yes. Yes, Chris yeah. is a very well-known photographer and has been published in, uh, what's, what's the most famous magazine you've been published in? Um, I've I've had a couple pictures that have been in the various national like National Geographic Kids um, and and an ad in in the, the big magazine. So published I can say I've published in National Geographic. Yeah, gorgeous photos. So before we get to the questions, you guys, I'm going to just launch one last poll. Be, we just want to get some feedback um, from you, just the overall um, presentation, and then if you learned anything. And I know we're still waiting on some questions, but. I like to just get this feedback before I forget, and then we're gonna go into the Q&A, see what you guys um, wanna know from Chris. And if you have any other questions, just get them into the Q&A ready to queue up because we're gonna get there just in a second. I'm gonna give it about another 30 seconds for you guys to answer the poll. 
appreciate you guys doing that. So let's go into the Q&A. So the first question, Chris, um, Calvin is wondering, can COVID affect gorillas? So this is a, a very good question. And the, the, the real answer is that nobody knows for sure. Um, but we, there's, there's kind of no reason to, to believe that they wouldn't be affected. So we know that, you know, that humans, oops, did I, you can still hear me, yes? Yes. I, I hit something on my keyboard. <laughs> um, we know that um, humans can be um, infected with it, and we know that um, there are monkeys that are used in laboratory studies that can be infected with it, and so gorillas are kind of somewhere between humans and those monkeys, so the, the assumption is that they, that they can be infected, and, and there are, um, if, so, so tourism for gorillas has actually stopped um, in all the places that, that usually have tourists because they don't want people coming in with COVID and potentially spreading it to gorillas. Um, so the, the short answer is that, um, yes, we, we assume that COVID would affect gorillas. <clears throat> so what is your favorite part about working with gorillas? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think um, the, I mean, the favorite part, you know, the the what's not clear when I give a presentation like this is actually when you do kind of the work kind of as as a veterinarian um, yes I showed you lots of pictures of being out in the forest with gorillas but but normally on any given week when I was working I might be out in the field one day and then in the office the other four days so um, so actually just being out with gorillas is is was always a pleasure but I think what's great is you know even though I've spent somewhere between two and three thousand hours you know out out in the forest and in the jungle with gorillas. I feel like I see different behaviors and I learn something new about them every day. So I think that they're, you know, they're very smart animals. They have really complex behavior and complex social relationships. So, um, you know, there's, there's sort of no, um, no shortage of different, you know, sort of new things to see um, with gorillas and also different personalities. So that, you know, every day with gorillas is kind of a, a new and exciting um, chance to, to learn something new. Nice. And another question from Calvin, why do you only see Western gorillas in zoos? That is a good question, Calvin. Um, and so, so there's actually one exception to that. So, uh, and, I, and when I give a talk like this, I assume that most of you have never been to Belgium. And so there is actually one gorilla left in a zoo in Belgium who, who is from the Eastern, the Eastern species. Um, but the, the, the answer is that the Western population is actually much bigger, so there are a lot more of those gorillas. So just on the chances that anybody was going to go out and try to capture gorillas to put in zoos, it was just much more likely that they would have come from the bigger population. But the other part of it is that, you know, related to the fact that the, the mountain gorillas in particular are, are adapted for a really sort of special climate. And so, so that just seems that they never, there, there were some that were in zoos and in captivity um, a long time ago, and just most of them just didn't do very well because that, you know, in most places, the, the climate in a zoo, you know, the, the heat and the, you know, the food and all that sort of stuff is just not, not very good for them. So that's, that's part of, that's, that's the best explanation I can give you. And Tamsin's wondering, um, are these groups always related? The, with, within the group? I'm, I'm guessing the question is: Are, are the are, are the are the gorillas within any family group all, all related? Um, the answer to that is um, not not strictly. So there so oftentimes there might be a male gorilla that comes in from another group and takes over a family, and so and and then the different females in a group they may have all of their their babies, but they may not be related to each other. So. So within any family, many of them will be directly related to each other, but not all of them will be related um, if, if it's a big enough family. Is that, I think that, if that, hopefully that answers the question. If that wasn't, if I didn't understand the question, feel free to ask again. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Sylvia would like to know, do gorillas' nose prints change over time? That's another really good question. Um, the answer to that is is generally they don't. So so they do change a little bit from when they're like really baby gorillas until they get to be kind of you know sort of teenager age. And so when they're real babies, they're, they're, the, the wrinkles are not very distinct. So sometimes they're just like a little bit of a dent that then becomes like a really big wrinkle. So once but once they get to a certain age, then they, they don't really change unless there is an injury. Um, and so we did actually have a case um, one time with a girl that ended up having a an injury and, and a cut across his nose. And for a long time, we weren't quite sure whether it was the gorilla that we thought it was because, you know, the, the lines in his nose were a little bit different. Oh. 
Um, Jasmine is wondering, is the gorilla population getting better due to the quarantine? Um, the, well, that's, I think the, the quarantine has been um, probably too short to, to really make much of a difference. So gorillas, um, they're, they're very slow reproducing, kind of like people. So a mother gorilla usually only has a baby about once every five years. So it's really, really too early to tell um, how much of a difference that's, that's making. Uh, but the good news is that, at least with the mountain gorilla population, that population, even though they are still endangered, is getting bigger. And so part of that is because of the veterinary work and all the, all the protection and the rangers and, and the fact that tourists will go and pay a lot of money uh, means that that, the, the, that subspecies has been very well protected. So they've been growing um, even before the, the quarantine and the pandemic. Great. Um, are gorillas very important to their ecosystem? Uh, that's another excellent question. So um, the, most people would say yes, um, and for a lot of reasons. So, so part of it is that you know we think of gorillas as being kind of an umbrella species, and and what we when we when we say that we usually mean that because you know gorillas are kind of well known and they're big and people like to go and see them or people like to study them. That means that when you're protecting the habitat for a gorilla, that you're also protecting the habitat for lots of other animals that people may not be as concerned about. So they're, they're important in that way and that you know, their, their habitat helps to protect um, a lot of other animals. But they're also really important um, for dispersing seeds. So because gorillas are mostly um, vegetarian, um, they, you know, they eat a lot of different plants and, and including a lot of seeds. And then there are a lot of those plants, um, you know, including some special trees, that actually, you know, that their seeds need to be eaten and digested and kind of passed through an animal and then pooped out in order to then germinate and turn into a tree. So it's kind of similar to elephants in a lot of these forests, that elephants are really critical for, for some trees. You know, gorillas are, are um, similar in, in, in um, being responsible for a lot of the, the plants and the other vegetation. Great. So Lena writes, I was reading about the FOXP2 gene, which researchers believe is responsible for the evolutionary development of humans' ability to speak, and was amazed by the genetic similarity between the human and gorilla variants of this gene. How complex are gorillas' vocal communication abilities? Well, that's a that's a quite a complicated question. Um, the 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 answer so part of this has to do with the um, so, so the the short answer is that gorillas can make a lot of different kinds of vocalizations. Um, you know, there's there's you know, and I, I, again, I'm not much of a behaviorist, so I don't know a ton about kind of gorilla behavior. But you know, there's sort of twenty or thirty different kinds of distinct you know vocalizations that gorillas can make. You know, there's pig grunts and different different sounds that all you know have different meanings. Um, so they can do a, a very wide um, variety of vocalizations, but because the, the, the anatomy of their throat is a lot different than ours, that they can't, they, they can't sort of form the same, the, the same, all of the same sounds that we can. So there have been efforts, you know, probably many of you know of the famous Gorilla Coco that uses sign language to talk. So there were studies, you know, mostly sort of 30 and 40 years ago where people actually tried to get gorillas and chimpanzees to, to, to be able to speak and make human sounds. Um, and generally they, they can make some sounds and you can train them to make a few more sounds than they can usually make, but they can't, they're not capable anatomically of making all the same sounds that, that humans can make. Um, what organizations did you work with in Africa? So the, the, the main one was the, the Gorilla Doctors, so formerly with the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project. Um, and so that was my, you know, where I did my PhD and um, what was, you know, ultimately my employer. Um, so I was that, was, that was kind of the main one, but in the process of working with them, you know, I also worked with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund was one of our partners, um, International Gorilla Conservation Program, which is a is sort of a collaborative between a bunch of other different organizations. Um, with the Western Lowland Gorillas, um, most of the work I've done with them has been with the World Wildlife Fund. So they, they run the project where, where those gorillas are in, in uh, the Central Africa. Um, and I've worked with you know, WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, who is you know, based out of the Bronx Zoo. So I've worked with a lot of the sort of big organizations um, in addition to the ones that I've been kind of directly involved with. Great. Have humans ever been injured by gorillas? Uh, Yes, humans have been injured by gorillas. So, so gorillas, um, you know, as I said earlier, gorillas are pretty protective um, of, of their families. And so, um, 
both in cases where people might have been intentionally trying to harm gorillas, like through poaching, or just accidentally getting too close to um, gorillas, or particularly baby gorillas, um, they they you, they might be um, get bit bitten. Um, and so I'm not aware of anybody that's ever been killed by a gorilla, um, but I know a lot of um, personal friends who have been um, pretty badly bitten um, um, by gorillas. So um, they they can be, you know, even though they're they're considered and we think of them as being, you know, relatively gentle. Um, you know, as they're kind of, they're vegetarian and, you know, they live in these, these social groups. Um, they are, you know, these are big animals and the males have big teeth. So they, you, you definitely have to be careful and, and treat them pretty seriously. So as a vet, how do you learn enough about gorilla medicine to go out and treat? Uh, that's another great question. Um, and so, so, so as a veterinarian, you know, we're trained to work with lots of different kinds of animals. So, you know, even, you know, the, the, when you go to your, you know, bring your cat or dog to your, your veterinarian, or those of you that live on farms might have veterinarians that come to your farm. I mean, everybody who's gone through vet school has been trained to work with at least cats and dogs and horses and cows and pigs, um, chickens, um, sometimes horses and sort of other specialties. So all these domestic animals. And then many of us also do special training and, you know, exotic pets you know, birds and reptiles and rabbits and guinea pigs and things like that. So, you know, in our general training, we're actually, you know, we're trained to work with a large variety, different variety of animals. And so even though we're never kind of specifically trained to work with animals like gorillas, um, you know, there are opportunities through vet school where, you know, so for example, when I was in vet school, I went to Africa three different times to work with chimpanzees and so started to acquire, you know, some experience and some of the, some of that training. Um, but generally speaking, it's, you know, the, the, the veterinary medicine, you know, we're, we're almost, as veterinarians, we're kind of constantly translating sort of from one species to the next. And the most important thing is just knowing about, you know, what, what some of the differences are. Um, and so, um, so it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, so the short answer is I got a little bit of training through school. Um, and then most of it is just the kind of stuff that we do as veterinarians all the time with just applying stuff that we learned, you know, from one, one species of animal to another. So Tamsin wants to know, since groups only have one male, what do the other males do? Yeah, so it's, the, so it's, not, um, it's not that groups only have one male, it's that when they, there's always one male who's, who's the dominant one. So sometimes there is only one, but in some big groups you might have, you know, the, the, when I was in Rwanda, there was a group that was 25 gorillas that had seven adult males in it. So you can have more than one adult male. Um, but but normally even if, even with that many there's still not as many male adult males in a group as there are adult females so there's always um, there's always the sort of extra males so sometimes um, the, there are males that when they get when they grow up in a group they might basically get kicked out of the group usually by their father who's going to be the dominant male and so they'll either decide like they're going to have to they might try to fight him to become the dominant male or they decide that they that they leave the group, and so they may be um, sort of solitary or individual males, you know, for you know sometimes a couple of years as they're trying to to then sort of form their own group. So that's so that's part of the offset, and then a little bit of it is that they do the males don't live as long, um, just like you know most other species, including humans, um, and they do occasionally you know die from from fight wounds to each other, and so so there are you know are, there are some of them that kind of that end up dying. But the, the, the best explanation is that there are some that live by themselves um, until, they, until they form a group of their own. Great. And Montana asked, uh, why do they want to capture the babies? Yeah, I didn't, didn't really um, explain that very well. So, so the, the, the reason is, so, so it used to be that, you know, the, the reason that we have gorillas in zoos is because people originally captured them. And so that doesn't happen anymore, that, you know, all the gorillas that are in zoos are now they're born in zoos and they just, they, you know, zoos trade them around and they move them around. But there's still um, this idea and a lot of people poach gorillas because they think that people want to buy baby gorillas. And there might still be some people, um, you know, that have private zoos or that might be buying, you know, baby gorillas um, a, a, that they think might be a pet. But obviously that's not going to last very long because once a gorilla gets bigger than a baby, you really can't handle it. So, so the, the, the real answer is that you know, for the most part, it's the poachers are, are kind of wrong in thinking that there are people that are going to want to buy these babies. Um, and so most of the time what happens is the poachers might, might capture, you know, kill a family and capture these babies. And then when they try to sell them, 
they, you know, the police or the conservation organizations learn about it, and then, then the poachers get arrested, and the babies get confiscated, and then they, they end up in a sanctuary because they, they can't go back in the wild. So there are a lot of sanctuaries um, across Africa that have, you know, baby girls and baby chimpanzees that have all been basically taken, taken back from, from poachers. Um, so this question asked, do you have rehabbers in these areas? No. Um, yeah, so, the, so if you're talking about rehabbers, like the people that would take care of these, these um, you know, what we refer to as orphans, these orphan mm -hmm. baby gorillas, um, then, then yes. Um, but, they're, but, but generally speaking, they're, they're almost all the time, once gorillas go into sanctuaries, they will stay there for their whole life and, and usually die in those sanctuaries. Um, and it's partly because it's, it's very difficult to, to return them to the wild. Um, and again, there are a couple of exceptions to this, but um, it's very difficult to try to return them to the wild just because of their social groups. So you, so you can't really kind of put individual gorillas out very easily. Um, and the other part is that, you know, once, once they've been in captivity and they get used to people, then they can, you know, be a problem. You know, if you think of, you know, their problem, like, you know, grizzly bears and black bears that sometimes once they have broken into somebody's house, then they know that that's human food. And so it's hard to train them out of that. Um, so, so that's certainly part of it. Um, and the other big thing is that in a lot of the places, the reason that they're getting poached is because people can't, there aren't enough rangers to protect the forests. And so, so even, even though you, know, you might be able to rehabilitate a lot of you know, the, these baby orphan gorillas and let them grow up to a certain age, there generally isn't a lot of places, there's not a safe place to put them, which is part of the reason that they're getting poached in the first place. Montana asks, cell phones play a big part in this. Do you think people would change their minds if they knew the effect they had? I, uh, yeah, I, part of me, I, I mean, my, deep down, my answer is I wish they would. Um, and I, like I said, I don't think people are ever going to, you know, give up cell phones. But I think that there's a lot more that we could be doing in terms of, you know, not, not re replacing our cell phones every year. Um, you know, making sure that when we're done with a cell phone that it goes somewhere to get, you know, for some of the minerals to get recycled, you know, all, all of those kinds of things. So I think, you know, we certainly, I think, I think the important thing is that we, we consume or we use more cell phones. And it's not just cell phones, actually, it's also other, you know, computers and different t things. Um, you know, and we we obviously need those things for most of the work that we do, but I think the systems could be a lot more efficient. Um, and there also could be, you know, some expectation that the, you know, where these minerals are coming from are places that are, that are mining it legally in places where there aren't other, other wild animals. And so, you know, but to do that, that would mean we'd all have to pay more for our things to make sure that they're certified. But I think there are a lot of, a lot of solutions along those lines that would help. The next two questions I'm going to put together because they're a little similar. Um, Emily would like to know how far we should stay away from gorillas, but with Steri and Cosimo both want to know how far away can you smell gorillas? <laughs> now, those, those are good questions. So, so the question about how far to stay away. Um, so, so one of the things I didn't really talk about is that, you know, the gorillas in almost all of the pictures I showed you are gorillas that have basically over years and years of work have gotten used to having people be there. So they're what we call habituated. So normally if you went out in the forest and found gorillas, they would run away before you ever got anywhere near them. Um, but if with good trackers and, and years and years worth of work, you can basically make gorillas realize that they don't have anything to be afraid of and they stop running away. So that's what, so that's the, the, the case with most of these the gorillas that tourists go to visit. So, um, so theoretically you can get, you know, pretty close to them, but they, but they, you know, like most animals, they, you know, they have a sort of spatial distance, like they're not comfortable with you getting too close. So they would, you know, even, even sometimes when you approach them, they'll sort of bark at you and say, hey, you're getting too close. Um, but so generally they, you know, like a lot of wild animals, they're not comfortable with people being too close. But the, the rule is that um, when you're a tourist or a visitor, that you're not supposed to be any closer than and seven meters. So most of the world uses the metric system. So we use seven meters, which is about seven yards or about 20 feet. Um, and so that's, that's the, the regulation that's in place for, for going to visit gorillas. And so, and, and the reason for that actually has to do with, with the spread of disease. So as you know, you know, most of the time right now, we're talking about social distancing of kind of at least six feet. And for most of us that have you know, worked with gorillas, we would say, actually, it should be 
you know, quite a bit farther than that. So it really is a question of, you know, how safe do you want to be? Because the farther away, the safer it's going to be. So that's the answer to, to you know, how, how close, you know, so you can get a lot closer than that, but that's the distance that we try to enforce to, to make sure that we're not spreading diseases with gorillas. Um, the question about smelling gorillas. Um, so, so if, um, so maybe you're asking that question because it could be that some of you actually smell gorillas like if you've gone to the zoo. And so the, particularly the male gorillas have a, have a very distinct smell and, and often um, it, it's like a sweaty, musky smell and, they, and oftentimes they can, they can basically make themselves smell when they get afraid or when they're trying to have a fight or when they're trying to um, kind of signal to other males. So it's a very strong, distinct smell. And, and that smell actually can linger in the forest for a long time. Um, so it really doesn't, so, so you know, once the gorillas have sort of made that smell and, it, and it's kind of secreted like through their sweat glands, then they can go really far away and that smell can still be sort of lingering, you know, very, very far away from the gorillas. Now, but other than that, gorillas generally, you know, they don't, they don't smell like much. I mean, they, you know, they, they smell like, you know, the environment and all the vegetation and things that, that they're in. So aside from that specific, you know, smell, which is, kind of a, you know, associated with a sort of a fear smell um, of adult gorillas that they generally don't smell like much. And our final question, um, what do you work on now? So I still, th there, there are um, rare occasions that I still get called from, from some of my colleagues and collaborators and, and run off to Africa to do, to do things with gorillas. Um, but most of my work, you know, since I'm now um, kind of settled and, and working as a professor at the veterinary school, um, I'm working on a couple of projects, um, mostly with my students. And so I'm, I've been looking at, um, there's a fungal disease that affects snakes. And so we've been looking at, um, and it's, and surprisingly enough, it's called snake fungal disease. Um, and so we've been, we've been studying that and looking for that um, in water snakes around right where I'm in central Massachusetts. I've also been looking at um, lead poisoning and gray squirrels. Um, and there's kind of a long story with that, but we've we found that um, gray squirrels um, are, are being exposed to lead um, for reasons that we don't really understand that we're trying to study a little bit more. Um, and then I've also um, had a student that just completed a project actually with, with um, samples from Vermont. So um, most of you, probably many of you are hopefully familiar with a fisher or what we often is called a fisher cat. Um, which is a wild animal, you know, in the forests, you know, throughout New England. Um, and so we were doing a study looking at their exposure to basically um, rat killing poisons um, and, and looking at, um, you know, how, how they might be getting exposed to some of those, those toxins in the environment. So that's some of the stuff I'm working on now. All right. Now I do have to give Calvin, he slipped one more question okay. in. I'm going to give him the last word because this is kind of funny. Not as a great question, but I love the question. I love the humor in the question. Do gorillas actually eat bananas, or is that just a stereotype? <laughs> that, Calvin, that's a really good question. Yes. Um, and and the truth is that there um, there really are not any wild bananas that or anything that we would recognize as a banana that grows wild um, in in any of their habitats. Um, but there are. Um, the, the farmers in some of these areas do grow bananas and, and the, most of the bananas that, that farmers grow in this, these parts of Africa, they're actually, they're not the sweet bananas that we're used to eating. They're, they're I mean, it look, you would recognize it as a banana, but it actually tastes more like a potato. And so this is actually a pretty common crop in, in a lot of places around it. So the gorillas will um, go and, and basically leave the park and go outside to, to raid basically farmers fields and eat those bananas so they so the answer is is yes and no so um, yes they do um, but but only as sort of a cultivated crop but they're they don't um, they don't eat any sort of like wild there aren't any wild bananas in, in the places that they that they live well that's fantastic you guys fantastic questions for our guest today so let's all thank Chris for coming and sharing his knowledge with us and his gorgeous photos um, so Chris, thank you. We loved having you as part of our quarantine virtual science cafe. Thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you next week. We have another very cool topic. We have some Vermont researchers using game technology um, and how it addresses diseases on farms. That's as best as I understand it at this point, but it sounds really interesting. So thank you all. You guys can just leave the meeting and I'm going to.